Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Twin Talks 2 workshop, which is actually the third um, uh, Twin Talks workshop we are running. That's caused by the coronavirus that um, forces to postpone uh, the Twin Talks 2 from March to uh, October. The organizers are Daria and, uh, and, and me, and we are uh, organizing this on behalf of um, two organizations, Clarion Eric and Daria Eric, and one project at Shock. And um, well, I'll, I'll briefly tell you something about uh, these uh, three entities in, in case you don't know. <clears throat> um, well, the main objective of this whole series is, is getting a better understanding of the collaboration between humanities and digital experts when they're trying to solve humanities research problems because, and uh, understand how the collaboration works and understand what the obstacles are. And of course, uh, figure out how we could overcome the obstacles. So the expected outcome of the, the workshop is some recommendations for, especially for those who are involved in the education of humanity scholars and the humanities professionals, but also technical experts who are doing the technical, who are doing the technical work in digital humanities. And uh, uh, we would also, especially uh, from the, the perspective of these three organizations, uh, see how we as Clarion, Daria and Shock could, uh, could, could support this activity because we are large organizations and uh, we have a lot of expertise on board and we have lots of connections with the, the education world and with the research world. So we'd, we would like, very much like to be able to do something in order to support this. On the next slide, um, I'll very, very briefly uh, give you an, an idea of what Clarin is. Clarin stands for the Common Language Infrastructure, uh, Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It's an, um, it's an ERIC, it's a legal entity, an international legal entity. And what we want is easy and sustainable access to uh, scholars, for scholars in humanities and social sciences and beyond, because it's not limited to those two groups, uh, access to digital language data, because the fo our focus is on language. But language data could be in any form you can think of. So it's written, spoken video, or multimodal, or sign language, or whatever. And we also want to give access to not just the data, but also advanced tools to work with them. And we also want to create an environment where you can just through single sign on um, become part of this and uh, make use of all the, the facilities, just like let's say the at your own. Now, what do we? Uh, what, do, what do we promote, especially? Well, uh, open science, which means uh, sharing and reuse of data, uh, open access. Uh, we also want to support linguistic diversity because we don't want to uh, do what you very often see in computational linguistics, just focus on English because everybody's working on English in English. But actually, I think that Engl English is one of the easy languages. And I think if your own language is um, more complicated than English, then I think it's quite an achievement to provide all the tools and the facilities that you um, uh, the researchers need in order to do the work properly. So it's uh, we are going for a very broad linguistic coverage. We also adhere to the fair data principles, so it's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. I'm not going to explain this in detail because you can find all these this information on the Clarion website. We uh, focus on a specific set, uh, specific sets of data types. Uh, we don't limit ourselves to these types, but we have identified a number of uh, data types, families of, of resources that lend themselves for uh, cross-border uh, and cross-language research, which, which we think is very uh, important since we are part of the European space. And uh, here are some examples of these um, the families. And we offer a variety of services and uh, well, we a big catalog where we have a portal, we offer depositing services, et cetera, et cetera. Next, on the next slide, we tell you something about Daria. That's also a, a, a pan-European digital research infrastructure. They support digitally enabled research and teaching across the arts and humanities. So it's a bit broader in scope because as I said, Clarion is focusing on language, but there, of course, there are many uh, overlaps and points where we can collaborate. Um, they are, are uh, also a legal entity. And on the next slide, you will see that what their mission is to empower research communities with digital methods to create, connect and share knowledge about culture and society. 
So language is also there and uh, we always collaborate with them wherever we can because I think it's, uh, it's very, very, uh, uh, can be a very productive collaboration. And what they offer is marketplace reusable tools, education training, transnational and transdisciplinary working groups, and they also focus on policy and foresight. On the next slide, you will see a bit about the shock project. It's a huge project, uh, as you see, a huge budget, especially for the, for the humanities. And uh, it um, basically the partners are uh, uh, S3 landmarks and project that is, they are uh, mostly international, the uh, social science and humanities uh, data infrastructures. It's a long term project. And what they want is um, they, they're focusing on the open science cloud. And uh, again, I'm not going to explain that here in detail, but I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. And this project will take care of the social science and science and humanities part of this European open science cloud. And uh, well, they're just like uh, Clarin and uh, Daria, they're very much into open science, fair principles, interconnecting existing and new infrastructures, because we think that the infrastructure should not be not be seen as isolated things because we what we want to have is an interconnected network of infrastructure across Europe that makes offer easy access to all the, the our wonders to all the researchers that would like to make use of it and they also need to establish a pro appropriate governance model on the next slide you will um, see it's probably too small to, to read, but uh, something about the expected impact, integration of SSH in the European Open Science Cloud, um, availability of an EU-wide easy to use open marketplace where tools and data are openly accessible for everybody, available, availability of uh, cloud ready SSH tools, etc. etc. These are just a few highlights, and if you're interested, you uh, we would recommend you to go to their websites to see more. Okay, this is about the three organizations behind the, uh, the workshop. Well, the schedule you have seen, so I, uh, we, um, I have a few housekeeping remarks, but we start with the invited talk, then we have uh, five uh, short presentations, all 10 minutes each, and then 10 minutes for questions related to these papers, and then followed by three, 10 minute presentations and questions related to those papers. And then um, the, our invited speaker will continue his talk in a slightly different um, manner, I think. And after that, or maybe uh, uh, probably uh, uh, maybe already included in that um, the part, we will have a general discussion where we try to arrive at conclusions. Um, so one thing in our first announcement, we said that we sent you yesterday, we said that we um, we're going to make recordings of all the presentation, and that is something that we certainly want to do. We also said that we were not planning to make recordings of the discussions. And uh, here I would very much like to, to keep this a bit open, because since this workshop is not just a mini conference with uh, uh, eight or, or 10 presentations uh, after which we go home and uh, have a drink, but the idea is that we achieve something, that we like to identify uh, important points that have to do with collaboration, that is, uh, that we identify obstacles for collaboration, uh, solutions, uh, recommendations, and uh, conclusions, and uh, defining further steps. And I think that if the discussions are not all too confused and messy, it is worth recording also this part because that is I hope the place where all the good and brilliant ideas are born that will come out of this workshop. So this is what I would like to say and then I um, hand over to Daria because she will introduce uh, our invited speaker Federico Nani. Hello everyone and uh, a special hello to our invited speaker Federico Nani. Uh, he is a historian by background but is now a data scientist at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, we have been in touch with him a couple of years ago when he was still working on 
parliamentary data. Uh, we met at our workshop on parliamentary data uh, at the ELREC conference in Japan, and we just started in very engaging discussions that uh, seem to be never ending and we kept in touch ever since. Uh, so we really hope that we could continue the discussions in Riga, uh, not only during the workshop, but also at the uh, dinner. Unfortunately, we can only invite him to our virtual format of this workshop, but um, we have been in touch with him in trying to prepare an engaging and as interactive as possible invited talk. So this will be a little bit of an experiment for us all, where his invited talk will be divided into two parts. In the first part, he will try to um, somehow present his case from uh, founding his uh, research in actual um, uh, history, the discipline of history, and then have a bridge to data science, and then try and look back uh, on the discipline of history uh, on all three relevant aspects for this workshop, which is teaching, collaboration, as well as publications. After we will hear uh, your talks, then he will go back and uh, give us some input, uh, ask questions, make comments to your contributions, hopefully engaging us all in a fruitful and inspiring discussion at the end of the workshop. So very welcome, Federico, and the floor is yours. I, uh, thanks so much, Daria. Thank you all for inviting me. So uh, as Daria mentioned, uh, my idea was um, yeah, that I'll give you a quick overview of my background and use this like to start posing some initial questions and some initial point for discussions. And then in the second part of the keynote, we could have like an open discussion in which I will try to connect some of my questions on your presentation to a more general discussion around uh, collaborating across disciplines and these kind of things. All right, um, so, um, so I'm Federico from the Alan Turing Institute here, uh, here in London. Uh, as Daria mentioned, I have a traditionally, uh, I'm like a traditionally trained historian and I have a background in contemporary European history from the University of Bologna. And up until 2013, I have been only briefly in touch with digital humanities through my bachelor and master thesis, but the main focus of my research was mostly methodological aspect of doing historical research. And, and in particular in my PhD, I was interested in understanding how to use web archives. So a different kind of source uh, compared to the ones that we saw before, but uh, the idea of using large collection of websites I archive over time as a possible new type of source for studying the present times. So one of the main sources that I was considering in my research was using the Internet Archive, which is a gigantic collection of websites that started in 1996, trying to understand how this could be a new uh, type of primary source for historians. And, but in, in my thesis, the focus was mostly on historical research and not really on method and computational approaches. It was mostly a theoretical methodological discussion around it. And in particular, it was focused around two points. The first one was how to deal with what we call scarcity of digital sources, given the fact that the web is very hard to capture. And it's very hard to, to preserve uh, in a comprehensive manner websites or in general digital objects. And one of the case study in my research given that my group in Bologna was based on history of scientific institution and history of universities, was focused on the University of Bologna website. And this is because uh, it was created in the early 90s and it's an interesting object to study if you want to understand how the university decided to engage online with students and how to attract international students and things like this. But at the same time, it was completely excluded from the Internet Archive, so it wasn't preserved at all due to some technical issues. And therefore, there were no snapshots over time of this object. So as you can see, even if it's like kind of a very recent type of primary source, it was at the same time very hard to stack to and to reconstruct. However, when you're dealing with web archives, or in general, when you're dealing with uh, digital objects, the other issue that you face is what we call the abundance of digital sources. In particular, if you use the Internet Archive, you will see that 
available at your prompt disposal, there are around 500 billion web pages that you can access directly through a URL search tool. So it doesn't mean that you can search, uh, you cannot search for keywords, you can search for URLs. So you need to know website that you want to browse or uh, there are APIs available for you if you want to download specific websites, for example. However, when I reached this point as a traditional trained historian, I didn't know how to deal with this abundance because I didn't have, well, uh, on the one hand, the methods for dealing with such large amount of websites or large amount of documents, but at the same time, I didn't even have the, the mind frame to approach this. So what I did in my research was, well, I was as a trained, like, you know, academics, I started writing paper, trying to problematize the, the situation. And I started collaboration with other people in digital humanities and other historians that were facing the same issues. And we organized panels together at the digital humanities conference and workshop trying to understand how from a, a, a traditional training in history, you could move and approach these type of sources. But at the same time, in the second part of my PhD, I decided to approach this directly and face through my experience, the type of learning that someone should go through in order to deal with this abundance. So uh, I decided to move more and more into data science and in data science methods. And, and to do this, I started by doing an internship. I took a break from my research for, for three months and I joined a research group in natural language processing in Trento. And they were looking for someone that wanted to learn a bit of NLP. Uh, so learn a bit of natural language processing and at the same time deal with sources in Italian because they were working with the newspapers in Italian and trying to do event mining of, of, uh, on newspapers. So I, I joined their group starting from, well, honestly, zero knowledge of uh, Python and, and only basic understanding of NLP because I did a class on, on computational linguistics back in my master. And there I, well, started learning through practice and being in a very supporting environment. But, but at the same time, the most important thing is that I started picking up the language and the culture around data science and around natural language processing. I started like understanding what people mean when they say doing a comparison with baselines and how to pick the right approach given a specific task, how to evaluate methods and what are metrics that people use and how they discuss about the evaluation. And given that I really liked this experience and I wanted to get more uh, and into, into data science, later that year, I got in touch with a young professor um, at the University of Mannheim, Simone Ponsetto, and he was setting up a new group in NLP in a computer science department and uh, the data and web science group in Mannheim. And the group will be focused uh, on NLP and NLP application to computational social science and digital humanities. So in theory, I approached Simone for a short visiting period of six months. Then I ended up spending five years in Mannheim between PhD and postdoc and research projects and things like this. But it was a really fruitful collaboration and a really great experience for me because, well, on the one hand, I, I dig deeper and deeper into text mining and information retrieval and natural language processing. And I was there when there was all these new deep learning buzz in NLP. So I was lucky enough to be in a group focused on, on deep learning to pick up and understand how the, uh, a research group approached this new wave of methods in, in the area. But at the same time, uh, it was useful because I started understanding how you publish in data science, for example, and how different it is a good research paper in data science compared to a paper in history. What are the aspects that are how you make your argument and what are the aspects that are in common and what are the things that are completely different. And then over the years, I understood more and more the role that I could have in this type of discipline, especially becoming basically a translator when people want to collaborate with each other, but simply they don't understand each other because they don't have a common language or they don't have a common understanding of the fact that they are saying basically the same thing using different words or using different concepts. And uh, then I had the opportunity of establishing collaboration across disciplines. Um, as Daria mentioned, we met each other when I was working in collaboration with the political science department because we were working on um, 
uh, ideology detection using NLP on parliamentary corpora. Then uh, I had many opportunities for teaching and this was super useful for me because when teaching introduction to NLP to digital humanities students, then you have finally the opportunity of thinking about these things and, and try to deliver to someone else in a very structured way. And, and then I ended up supervising many bachelor and master students in data science that they were fascinated about application in digital humanities. So uh, after five years of this, uh, I, I decided later to, to apply for a position at the Turing Institute as a research data scientist, which is like incredibly far away from what I was doing at the beginning of my research. But here at the Turing, on the one hand, I am learning more and more of best practices in software engineering and reproducibility and in the importance of ethical questions and EDI in data science. But at the same time, we are collaborating with the Living with Machines project, which is a large digital humanities project here in the UK. And there I'm involved as a data scientist in order to build collaboration with historians that are interested in using computational methods and NLP method in their research. So I ended up all the way around being the one that uh, is supporting our historians using information retrieval and NLP approaches in their research. Through this specific journey, I wanted to now focus on a more series of, of complex points on how to facilitate this in a more structured way. And instead of relying on, uh, you know, specific situation and the fact that I encounter many very supportive supervisors and collaborators along the way, how can we help these type of collaborations and interaction and transition across disciplines? So when I joined the Turing um, last November, Barbara McGillery was working on a white paper here on the uh, prospects and, and interaction between humanities and data science. And Barbara involved me in the writing uh, of this white paper. And among the point that we are raising, there are three specific things that I'd like to discuss with you later during the day. The first one is about training and the fact that we need to address the training problem. And we need to address the fact that we need to upskill humanities researchers from the very beginning of their training to give them uh, the understanding of the fact that there are other methodologies out there and there are quantitative method and computational method and these need to be embedded in their training from the beginning and they shouldn't be a final seminar that they do at the end of their educational cycle but at the same time it's important that we also educate people that are working in scientific disciplines and would like to collaborate with humanities researchers, that there are a, a different way of uh, doing research and there's a different framework and uh, a different type of approach that they should be aware of and they should learn how to dialogue with each other. The second point that we raise is about funding and it's important that there are funding schemes that to support collaborative data science projects. And it's important that they are supportive of having humanities colleagues embedding a research project from the beginning and not as an additional thing at the very end, only to make the research project a bit more sexy for the final call. But at the same time, it's also important that the evaluation commissions there and the funding bodies recognize the importance of interdisciplinary research. And so uh, research projects that are interdisciplinary should be evaluated by commissions that are themselves interdisciplinary. Uh, and finally, uh, an important point on career, and it's important that we recognize the value of people that have an interdisciplinary background and establish and support collaborations as key players in a research project. I'm generally against this rhetoric of considering these people lucky because they ended up in the perfect spot for their profile and we should value them because they are people that are usually essential in these research projects. And at the same time, we should support and offer new career opportunities for them. Here in the UK, we are discussing a lot about uh, the research software engineering community and the fact that the uh, digital humanities people should become part of this community as well. And the thing that I'm doing and trying to bridge and bring these things together at the Turing in collaboration with the Living with Machines project is a, an idea of introducing from now on our research papers instead of a traditional list of authors, 
with a cover page where we introduce the contribution that each author did in the paper across different aspects to show all the interdisciplinary collaboration and, and all the movement that you have of people out of their discipline comfort zone and collaborating across different aspects. And for example, we wanted to show how historians are supporting us in the method and the implementation of approach, but at the same time, how data scientists are collaborating and supporting the creation of uh, annotation guidelines or the writing of the paper, just to highlight that people are already moving outside their comfort zone. It's important to value this. So I'm now working with the Turing Way project on a chapter for the, the Turing Way book, which is a book on best practices in data science to bring further this idea. And so if you want, we can discuss about this or discuss about some of the points that I raised. And if you have any feedback or any idea, let me know now or later during the workshop. And thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Federico. Do we have any questions from the audience? Can I ask a question? Sure. Of course. I'm just curious, could you give us an example of a topic, let's say a, a humanities topic that you would teach to uh, computer or data science students? Just oh. an example of something that you would teach, teach them. Huh, interesting. Okay, uh, an easy example and one of the things that we usually people now teach are all ethical questions or, or ethical approaches. So you, you, it's humanities in a broad sense because there are maybe topics uh, from, from philosophy and from ethics that I think they, they are somehow easy to teach now in data science or in computer science because people will probably relate. So question about ethical choices and things like this. However, I'm, I'm a bit critical around this because it, it seems again that we are simplifying what the humanities are to a, a one specific discipline and one specific area. So one thing that maybe from living with machines where we are mostly discussing about history is about um, um, reliability of sources. And the fact that we are most of the time dealing with things that we know are a, a approximate representation of the past. Or, um, so I'm at the Turing, I'm running a discussion group on humanities and data science. And actually, now it's open to everyone. So I should send the link around for the next session. And the next one will be on um, ground truth in the humanities and the fact that we work in the humanities, accepting the fact that there is no ground truth and we are. And we are okay with it. And so, so these kind of topics, I think like bringing things that are not like binary and they are not like completely distinct, distinct could be one way of approaching students. And, and they had great experience in Mannheim. I mean, students in computer science were like extremely reactive with these ideas. Uh, just like we need to find a nice way of engaging with them. Okay, thank you. That's interesting, yeah. I also have a question for you. If uh, anyone from the audience wants to step in, just let me know. But before they do, I will have a question. Uh, how do you see the evolution of methodology in the humanities with the data science uh, affordances? Do you see that uh, the data science methods will be incorporated in the humanities? Will, will the humanities or historical uh, methodological approaches be reinforced by quantitative uh, results? Will there be a merger of the two or uh, will there be a completely new methodological direction arising in the coming decade or so? Ah, um, ah, tricky. Uh, so I, I think there are things where we should and this is open for discussion, so please uh, jump in. But there are things around which we should accept that we need computational methods and quantitative methods. Like, I think the easiest example is probably information retrieval. So when we are dealing with large collections and we need to search for something, we are relying on a computational method. It could be a very simple heuristics and we are just searching for keywords and rank them somehow or we use something more advanced, but it's basically, we are already using a, a computational method to go through this collection. And so 
on that, it's important that we give some training to, to historians or to humanities people to problematize this and understand that there are limitations when we are doing keyword search or when we are using word embeddings to represent semantics or these kind of things. Um, but that, that is one thing. So you are basically searching and you know that there are some risks, but then for, with the information that you retrieve, then you can conduct uh, close reading or qualitative research on the output. And on the, I, I, I'm not a huge supporter of the idea that the humanities should drastically transition to the use of quantitative methods for building narratives. But I think that the way that we construct our narratives could be based on both approaches and both of them have limitations. And it's important that we discuss about them. But I don't, I am not a believer of this transition into computational humanities in a sense, in a very quantitative sense. Um, there, there are advantages for sure. And uh, maybe it's important that we openly discuss uh, about reproducibility and the fact that, I, I, I don't mean that quantitative and computational approaches are more reproducible, but for sure there are guidelines that we can follow in that field while maybe, but again, open for discussion, maybe qualitative approaches or closed reading could be harder to reproduce in a sense. So I hope we will find a convergence, uh, like a middle ground, but I hope it's a middle ground which is based around the idea of uh, reproducibility and, and a complete understanding of the things that we are doing.